Were you confident of beating the murder case? I never knew for all the evidence as I knew mm. uh, my defence counsel. And the only time I was ever strongly aware he was to us, go back to this Bible again. It's a Gideon's Bible. Uh, people like to look at what your star sign is for that day and all the rest of it. <clears throat> this Bible is Gideon Bible. I had an almanac at the back. So doesn't matter what year it is, January 1st is all January. You're familiar with that, Sean, eh? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'll, I've, I've sat at this trial thinking, this is going to get stopped shortly. I don't even know the guy. I've never spoke to him. <clears throat> it's impossible how that. I'm trying to work out how they're going to do it. Right? Mm. And then he swore on his two kids' dead ashes that he's telling the truth. And I, I couldn't even look at the jury. Honestly, I just thought, do you know what? How the fuck am I going to explain this one? Going back up to, uh, to Bellini. And as soon as they opened the cell door, I went, I went in. I got a piece of paper. I don't know how I'd, how I'd done this. It just wrote something. I wrote about Peter Sutcliffe. I don't know everything about Peter Sutcliffe. I know the, the thing. Peter Sutcliffe killed every other woman apart from his own wife, Sonia. So there must be some mechanism in these people that protects the family. And that thread allowed me to believe in their thesis for Donald Finlay the next day to say, he's either not got kids or the kids are alive and well. Because mm. he's not going to desecrate, who's going to desecrate the, the, the kids' ashes? So, when I'd done that thesis, and then I thought, right, what have I read today? This is the biggest point. Here. I've opened the almanac. I'm going to get the pages. I'm going to get the numbers because it's important for me to tie this date down, right? I've opened it up, and it's, it was to read the proverbs, aren't they? And the proverb was, do not fear the serpent that's, that, that, that bears false witness against you. No, do not fear the serpent with a forked tongue that bears false witness against you. I dropped the fucking hand. <laughs> I dad, I went out in an electric shock and I thought, mm. I need to read that again in case I go to the wrong day. So I'm armed with the, the thesis for Donald Finlay. I get a massive amount of courage for somewhere and going, I'm having a go at this. Just, I look for signs. And, and it was just, when I went and, and presented it, what I never knew is my lawyer, Peter Forbes, and Donald Finney had already requested the attendance of this guy's ex-wife. So again, my head's in bits. I'm sitting in the, the, the dock. Now, here's this name being called. It's never, ever on a witness list. I used to send Donald Finney notes to ask different things. As I sent him a note, as in, I think I wrote, who the fuck is this? And he turned around and went, it was Dennis Wilkinson's ex-wife. And I never knew it at the time. So when she went into the witness box, I seen the, the prosecution went to stand up. The judge had made a motion, sat there. He took his wig off and had a chat. I'm thinking, this is surreal. But what he said to her is, uh, how long were you married to your ex-husband? It was a couple of years. Have you got any kids? Yeah, there are two kids, boy and a girl. Uh, long have you been separated? I think it was like 18 months or something. Have you got any, has your husband got any kids with anybody else? And she's went, no. Right. So when would your ex-husband would have known the kids were alive and well? And she said, last week we sent him letters and photographs. Oh, wow. And I've looked at the jury and went, it's a fucking joke there. They should have stopped the trial. Yes. They should have stopped the trial, just a farce. But further on, I, I couldn't believe what the trial judge said to the jury. He said, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, even the worst of liars may tell the truth sometimes. <sighs> they had so much money invested in it, didn't they? As well? It's a farce. People talk it was the biggest long, it's a farce. You, you take away all that evidence, what have they got? They did nothing. Absolutely. It should never even went to trial. 
How do you feel when the verdict came down? Uh, do you know what? There's a story about that. There's a story about it. I get loads of stuff, loads of confidence for reading material that I was reading. Uh, when I seen the jury coming in, there was this girl who was crying and I thought, <laughs> they fell for this. So I'm getting ready for the fact that I'm not going to shout and bawl. I'm not. It's got to accept us. It's just another one. My head's elsewhere until I hear, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And do you know what I found that day? I failed a test. I never kept my faith to the end of it. And see the minute I recognised that, pff, I'm sorry, it came back. <laughs> and then when I'd seen the lawyers and they said, there's a crowd out there for, you need to go and face it. Say what you've got to say. Ask for a public inquiry. And the activities, he would mean, not that you're going to get it, or, or, or any at all like that, because they don't like to air the dirty laundry in public, but I will, and continue to do it. So, there's a one that they've done, the scandals that shocked Scotland. It was introducing somebody like that as a witness. I hope they all got the sack. When you got found innocent, Paul, how did that affect you physically? The relief from facing a life sentence. Physically, it was it was strange because I had the belief uh, weeks and weeks before it uh, about the strength I got through my solitude, my reading, uh, the, the kind of Machiavellian stuff that they were trying to do. I've seen it all before, but this was really the coming close. So I had to be confident, confident in myself, and. One of the surreal things that happened was the police officers that take you to court, it's usually the same ones. So you've got the outriders, the motorcyclists, you've got the van and you've got another van and the helicopter and all the rest. So the people in the van, the police officers in the van, one of them happened to say to me, uh, Paul, do you think this trial will last until the end of June? And I thought, I can hope no. I says, I'm going to the Bahamas on the 12th. <laughs> and they look and they laugh and they go, I went and at half past three. And they laughed, they had a joke. That was maybe three weeks before all this, right? Wow. Right, so uh, the jury retired on the 11th. Oh, the Because of the nonsense they've heard. To, 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 somebody's, somebody's sworn the kid's ashes. You don't do that with a Glasgow audience. Don't do that with, when I say a Glasgow audience, don't do it with people who are, are well tuned into fucking violin stories. So that's a big no no. Uh, so, that in itself, I, I had an idea that's, that's going to go bad for the prosecution. But uh, on the 11th of uh, June, in the cells all day, walking up and down, waiting for a verdict, waiting for a verdict. Nothing, so I gets took back. Uh, Nothing particular, but what I did, what I did there, I, I knew on the 12th, I don't know why I knew, I, I knew I was going home. People say that you must have had the jury sorted. It was, it was just my belief in my system and what I heard at the start. I couldn't look at the jury at the start. There were so many charges that, that I'm supposed to have confessed. No, they know. So I left a note on the desk in my prison cell with a couple of packs of biscuits and chocolate. And I said, hmm, in the event that I'll be off to the Bahamas, have a bit of tea and biscuits. <laughs> I think I left it. Right? And it came back to haunt me a wee bit because, <laughs> what, I, no, I did seriously, so I went back down and uh, I arrived there the, the, uh, on the 12th spent another half a day, got to lunch, came back up to court, uh, and, and I'm thinking, I'm just, I'm gone. I just hear the verdicts. And and what what made me feel as though I've not got the strength to accept this now, but I ain't going to shout and bawl. If it happens, I ain't accept it. I know people have been in the same position like Tommy Campbell, Joe mm -hmm. Steele, and what are you going to do, shouting? Yeah. Yeah, mug yourself. So I've seen two of the people coming in crying and body language. My confidence went, completely went. 
I'm just thinking, waiting for this, fuck it, get me down the stairs. And then I heard the verdicts. And as I'm hearing the verdicts, I'm thinking, you've just failed a test. <laughs> you've not kept that to the end. But when I'm asking myself again, do you really apologise for not keeping your, this faith? If you have got an honest act, strength all came back. Not only the strength came back, a bit of humour came back. Because when I was, when they said, right, you're free to go, as I walked down the stairs, I look at the clock, it's quarter to four. <laughs> right, there's an escort there. There's an escort there waiting to take me back. And as soon as I seen them, I went, I've got an apology to make to you and they're gone. What, what for? I said, it was 15 minutes out. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I had the jury novel. <laughs> that was just a throwaway thing, that sort yeah. of, just something like that. So when uh, I got took into the main chambers with Donald Finlay, <laughs> he opened the curtain and went, have a look at that. And I, I'm wondering why there are all, all these people there. Because I'm in solitary confinement, I don't know. Most of them are all family, friends. It was like a spectacle to do what they've done. I don't know I'm going to get out. And uh, would you see me standing on the stairs talking to, to the media? Before that, there's a guy called Stevie Wilkie, who was the senior crime author, uh, crime writer for, I'm sure it was a Sun newspaper or the, or the News of the World. And because I'm free, and, and I, he said, Paul, will you give us an interview? I said, Steve, you got a car out there? He's went, yeah. I said, look at that. <laughs> because at that time, and I'll admit it again, I was asked to keep a, a, a diary by my solicitor. And what I had in the diary was just honest stuff that I had to write. But what I wrote in the diary was about personal stuff that the girl who used to come up and give me clothes every day, I had, I had different clothes every day for a trial, uh, that, that I, I went away from my ex-partner. I was now living with this girl. But I wrote something in the diary that I found that when I went back to see my kid and my ex-partner, I felt, why did I leave? And then there's a reason why I should be leaving, because it just creates a bit of static. And then I was just with this other girl and then thinking, what am I doing here? So I'm trying to write it in as best as terms I can in this diary, because it's got to go to the solicitor. So what I've wrote and is in it, uh, I found myself in a position, a weak position. I'm no strong enough to tell them both that I love them. And that was a, 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 an honest opinion. So there was a lot of other stuff in the diary. Uh, they eventually seized the diary anyway, and, uh, I'm, and, and I'm in the witness box, and at this time the two girls don't really know about each other, right? So the, <laughs> I know I'm laughing, I shouldn't be laughing at this one, but the prosecution, he goes away over, stands at the end of the, next to the jury and says, production such and such, which was the diary? So I guess, I think he's going to go for something. Hmm. He said, uh, go to page whatever page it was. So I've opened this page up and it starts, I couldn't find it in my heart to tell them both I love them. Oh. Right? He's trying to make me a, a love rat because there's six females in the jury. So he said, uh, could you read the, the production such and such, read page such and such. I've mumbled. I went, blah, blah, blah. And, then, <laughs> and he's at the end there going, we can't hear you, we can't hear you. So I've I've just kind of blanked him and looked right up at the gallery and read it and apologised. So when I'm getting out, the relevance is with Stevie Wilkie. I couldn't go to one without embarrassing another. I just I had to sort myself out. And what was the repercussions of you having to repeat the diary No, no, sentence. no, I think both, both of them had an idea, but it's, it's, it's I went, but I'm still friends with them, really, still friends. I've not spoke for many, many years, but but for me, everything that was in the diary, he picked up on it and I thought, you fuck off. Whoa, that was a, that was a hard one. But uh, <laughs> the, the strange thing about it, the, the next day, the two of them are sitting next to each other. And where was he? I can imagine what's happened. Was he in London? Was he... 
So they're getting the law, they know about it all now, but at that stage, I could not personally go and embrace one but without, without embarrassing another. That's why you see me making a kind of <laughs> short sprint to this, the, the, the vehicle with Stevie Wilkie. So I went through there and gave them uh, an interview. I never took any money f for the interview. Uh, I'd done it on the basis. <laughs> Just get me away for that now. Anyway. That's all right. Nice. What was your life like after you got out? Yeah, what was the first uh, thing you did after your release? Uh, no, there was quite a lot of press interest. There was a lot of people wanting to jump on and say a few things. And people made the assessment that, uh, oh, he, he'll disappear. I never. I stayed in Glasgow for a year. I've got two friends that have got two partners, two wives that uh, they were good enough for there for me. I ain't running away. Of if anything. Did stuff kick off again? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nobody wanted to know after that. Okay. It was just that there was a spurious uh, Crown Office letter that was manufactured with a guy called John Gallagher, along with Thompson Jr. Said I'd been working with the authorities for years. That, that letter was used to put through uh, defence witnesses' the letterbox just to let them know should they go to trial. But I used that for my defence. I got the alleged author that's supposed to have signed that and said, uh, because apparently there was a DX number on it that shouldn't be on it. It's old stock and it wasn't his signature. And it, show, it shows and demonstrates more about them that they can't have a have a fight without having to kind of uh, reduce somebody's character uh, for for whatever reason. So uh, they tried a lot of t different tactics, but the fact that uh, Thompson Senior died a heart attack, he, he actually died on one of uh, my friend's wife's birthday. And was, was it that... in the pub? Like the film. No, 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 it wasn't in the pub, but they couldn't show the whole thing about it. And the whole real story uh, was it was too long. He took a heart attack. By the time the ambulance got there, the defibrillators never worked because nobody charged them up. Whether they did work or no, we don't know. But uh, he did, he did uh, die in, in, in his house. In so his quite house. an early demise. I think he was 60. Uh, I think he was 61. Mm -hmm. 61. What happened to his empire? Crashed and burned. Crumbled. She was Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was one of the ones, that, it was all myth, the, the empire that he had and all the rest of it. I, I know, I was in the, the, the kind of close circle. Mm -hmm. It was it was loads of myth. They had quite a few quid. They, 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 were, they were quite wealthy and doing what they're doing, but why go through all that misery, not enjoy spending it and treating people like that? So the empire, there wasn't that much an empire. It was media-led stuff and all the rest of it. Not for me, maybe it did, I don't know. But uh, not a lot of people seen any uh, invoices coming back. Mm.